Hello, everybody. My name is Jordan Karadjov. I work for the VMware Open Source Technology Center. And in this talk, I'm going to show you how to write plugins for Kernel Shark. Uh, before we start, I, I want to say a few words about this talk. Our original idea was to uh, make a tutorial, but because of the current situation with the conference being online, we decided to switch to a regular talk. But uh, so this is something I'm calling quasi tutorial. You see a lot of code. Uh, you're not supposed to try running this code uh, during the presentation online, but uh, the examples will be will be available together with my slides, and you can download it and uh, try it. And we'll be we'll be very very happy to help you if you have questions offline. Uh, with that being said, let's move to the actual uh, talk. So we assume that you are. Uh, a kernel shark user already or at least that you know something about kernel shark and you are interested in using it uh, for this talk we have one uh, main goal which is to teach you how to customize the kernel shark gui uh, by using the kernel shark libraries and we have uh, something which is like a bonus goal for us uh, which is to actually show you that you can use the library without using the gui so let's see if this will be uh, successful uh, before we start, let's uh, see some uh, very basic definitions and one uh, extremely simple example. How do we access the data with the kernel shark libraries? Uh, so when you, uh, in this tutorial, I will assume that uh, you have a ftrace data record with trace CMD. In principle, kernel shark can open uh, uh, arbitrary data format, but uh, this is outside of the scope of this talk. So for the moment, we assume that you have a trace file recorded with trace CMD and you want to open it. So in your file, you may have a million of uh, tracing records, uh, very different event types, uh, hundreds of different event types. Each event type has specific data being recorded in it, uh, different data fields, uh, but not all of this uh, data is actually used directly by the visualization. Uh, and K shark entry, that's the basic data unit that we use in kernel shark is uh, a structure which holds only the absolute minimum of information uh, from each trace record that is needed in order to visualize. Uh, because uh, we show a kind of time series of uh, trace records, of course, we need uh, the time of the record. Uh, we also need the CPU core, the ID of the CPU core on, on which the record happened. We need uh, the process ID of the task uh, this record belongs to. Uh, we need a kind of identifier of the event type. And basically that's more or less everything that we need. Of course, there is more data being recorded and we need to have a way to access this data. So this can happen on demand when you need it via the offset in the file of the actual original record, which corresponds to this entry. And now let's see how we can use this in a very simple example. So how can you uh, open a data file? with the library, you first initialize uh, the context of the session, then you open the file. Because I want to uh, everything to fit on a slide, here are, the file is hard-coded, so I assume that uh, uh, your trace file is called trace.dat and it's in the same directory, uh, but uh, yeah, you, you have to make this more sophisticated. So you check if uh, the file was successfully open, then you load the data into this array of k -shark entries, if this operation is successful, you can loop over the entries and, for example, plot things like the CPU core, process ID, the time uh, of the record. Uh, the important thing here is that after you load the data, all okay, shark entries are sorted in time, which means that when you uh, do a loop like this, you will see the time of the records progressing. That's important. We will see why uh, later. And so let's say that you are interested, for example, in uh, sketch switch events, and you want to uh, check what is the next, the, the next priority when you do a context switch. Uh, so you can check if the event ID of the k -shark entry is the same as the event ID of the sketch switch. And if this is the case, you can use the offset of the, which is inside the entry to retrieve the value of the next priority uh, for this particular event. Uh, be aware that this is a, relatively expensive operation. So if you want to do this for a small fraction of the events, that's okay. 
uh, but if you try to do this for every single entry, uh, this will slow down your program uh, substantially. And you see that there are actually uh, clever ways to do this later in the presentation. Of course, at the end, you have to free all the resources that have been allocated, but this is trivial. And so far, so good. Uh, we are able to print the data to the screen, but other tools can do the same, and this uh, is not interesting at all. We want to see how we can visualize data, not to print it to the terminal. Before uh, trying to uh, visualize something, we have to understand the way the visualization model used by Kernel Shark works. Uh, back to our case, when we have a, a huge file containing a lot of uh, records, and let's say that you have this uh, file open in Kernel Shark, you've been zooming in, zooming out, scrolling here and there, and at some point you visualize only a, a fraction of this uh, uh, of the tracing data that has been recorded. And let's say that you are visualizing everything that is inside a time window, uh, which here is called T. So you are somewhere in the file and you visualize a part of it. Uh, and it's uh, within this time interval. The way we visualize this is to actually subdivide this uh, big time interval T into smaller uniformly sized uh, intervals, which we call bins, or we can call it bucket if you want. It's pretty much like a histogram. Uh, and when you want to visualize something, you only check what is going on at the beginning of the bin and at the end of the bin. Everything that is in between uh, gets ignored. Remember that the, when we loaded the data, it uh, was sorted in time. So in order to determine the state of the model, the only thing that you really need is to know the index of the first event in a given bin and the index of the first event in the next bin. So everything that is in between will belong to, to, the, to the bin we, we are looking for. Okay, this uh, was uh, the explanation of the model. The diagrams, they look cool, but uh, let's see some code. So back to the simple example from the very beginning. Uh, we, we open the file, we load the data into this array of kernel shark entries. Up to here, everything is the same as in the example before. So now we initialize the model here. The model is called histo. So we, we initialize the model, we set the binning because we want to keep everything as simple as possible for the moment. We'll get a very simple model, which has only five bins. And the range of the model will start from the time of the very first record and will continue up to the time of the very last record. So this basically means that we will visualize everything. And now, so the, the model uh, is, uh, the state of the model is uh, determined. So now we can fill the model with data. You, this is happening here in this uh, uh, fill function. And at that point, the model is ready to be used. So how can we use the model? We said that we want to see what is going on at the beginning of the bin and at the end of the bin. Uh, so we will first ask the model, okay, find for me the first entry, which uh, has this value of the CPU ID. So we, we were looking for, for data from CPU core two, and we want to this to be in bin number three, for example. And so we, you, we call this uh, callback function match CPU. So this will return for you the very first k -sharp entry from CPU2 in bin 3. And from, from the entry, you can retrieve actually the task name. So this is the, the name of the task uh, that corresponds to the, to the process ID, which is recorded inside the entry. You can do the very same thing with the last entry in this bin. And here again, you can plot, okay, this is bin uh, 3. It starts with uh, this task that has uh, this uh, process ID and the same bin ends with another task probably, which has a uh, different process ID. Uh, okay, so far so good, but this is still printing something to the terminal, which is uh, not what we want. Uh, and I guess it, it sounds too abstract to understand what is really going on. Here is actually seeing kernel shark visualizing something. So of course here, the number of bins is not equal to five, 
what we do is uh, the most natural one. So we just check what is the total number of uh, horizontal pixels available for drawing. And then we set the number of bins to be equal to the number of pixels available. So basically one bin is one pixel. And here you see a really huge data file open in kernel shark. So because this file is so, so big, uh, each bin actually contains uh, hundreds of uh, records. And so if you click somewhere on this graph, the marker will select the very first entry in the bin or pixel that has been clicked. Uh, in this case, you see marker A is, has something being selected. Uh, just imagine that you switch to marker B and somehow you manage to click to the very next bin that is exactly next to the one which you clicked uh, before. So in this case, you're not going to select the next event, you're going to select the first event in the next bin, which will actually be uh, thousands of events uh, distant from the, the one which you selected with marker A. So this is one extreme case of the visualization model when you have thousands of events in each bin. So, but let's see the, the other extreme, which is when you do a very, very deep zoom. In this case, the time interval which is being visualized is much, much smaller. That's why you see much less events. And so here with the, each vertical tick that you see on the graph corresponds to one bin. And the place where you see no ticks, these are bins which are empty. They contain no data. So most of the bins in this case are empty. And you have some bins containing just one entry. So this time, if you click on a vertical tick, you select the single entry in this bin. And then if you click to the next tick, you select the next entry. Uh, you, you see the next the text of the next uh, record being sh showing up in the table. So these are the two extreme uh, states of the model. And of course it can be in any state in between those. That's dep that's from depends from you if you zoom in, you you go deeper, if you zoom out, you go, you see a broader view. Uh, okay. So this, uh, I, I hope with this, you, you understand the way the model works, uh, but this is the built-in model. So that's the, the visualization that comes uh, out of the box. That's not what we want to actually learn from this talk. So let's see how we can customize kernel shark. Uh, and let's start with uh, the equivalent of the Hello World program, which is the Hello World plugin. Uh, so this is the, the customization that you want to inject inside the GUI. So you, you want the GUI to print Hello World. Uh, that's your callback function, which you, you attach to uh, the, uh, the, the code of the GUI. So how can you uh, make this thing a kernel sharp plugin? Basically, what you have to do is just to build uh, this code as a shared library. And inside this shared library, you have to provide those uh, two uh, methods, the initializer of the plugin and the initializer of the plugin. And in, inside the body of the initializer, you have to register your callback function and you have to unregister it in the day initializer. It's as simple as this. So if you build this and you open this plugin in kernel shark, what will happen is that you, if you start kernel shark from terminal, you see a uh, hello world every time when you, you change something uh, in the graph. For example, when you zoom, zoom in here or zoom out or anytime when you change something, you will see this thing being printed. And actually you see it printed two times because in this particular example, you have two graphs being shown by the, uh, the GUI currently. So you see this thing printed once per each graph. Uh, again, this is completely useless, uh, but it's just a starting point to explain you how you can write a plugin. Okay, so let's do something which is still completely useless, but it's at least a little bit more interesting. Let's, instead of printing Hello World to the terminal, let's draw Hello World inside the visualization area of the GUI. So how can we do this? Uh, that's the modification that you have to do again, because I want everything to fit to a single slide. Some 
some things are hard coded here. For example, the, the, the font file is hard coded, but in the, the, together with my slides, I will upload uh, the code of the example. So there you can see how this can be done in a more appropriate way. So what do we do here? We just load the font here in this uh, get font function and inside uh, the, bo the body, oh, sorry, inside the body of your callback function, we call this routine print text. Uh, we provide uh, the font, uh, the color is no, which means it will be uh, plotted or drawn in black. Uh, here we give the coordinates and that's the text that we want to see. And if we, if you build such a plugin and if we load the plugin with kernel shark, we will see this, see, you, you see the, the hello world in the middle of your graphs. Uh, the important thing here is, so this text is absolutely static. No matter what you do, you can zoom in, zoom out. It always stays there unchanged. And that's because this plugin knows absolutely nothing about the data that is being visualized together with uh, the hello world uh, text. Uh, so, Again, this is completely useless. Uh, this can't help you solve your tracing problem, but it's a good step to learn. Now let's try to implement another plugin, uh, which this time will know something about the data which is currently being visualized. So this time you, you, you have to implement a different initializer so in, in the initializer, you register something which is called event handler. So the, this, the previous time we registered the draw handler, this time we will register an event handler. And that's the user action which we want to inject uh, into the, the original plotting algorithms used by kernel shark. So this uh, action will be executed when you load the data. So you register a callback for a specific event. In this case, it's, it is for this event ID, which corresponds again to the sketch switch event. Uh, that's how you retrieve the ID of the sketch switch event. So you register this uh, pluggable action for this event. And inside your pluggable callback, you first retrieve the value of the next priority. So this time, this is a different operation. Here, you don't use offset to jump up and down in the file because you already have the record in the memory by the time when this uh, callback is executed. So this is much faster actually. So you directly retrieve the particular field in the tracing record you are interested in, uh, next priority, and you can field uh, this uh, information into a, something which you call data container. So for each, if you have a plugin like this, for each SCAT event, you have an entry in the data container. You initialize data container here in the initializer of the plugin. Uh, I have no place on the slide to show the day initializer, but you basically here you have to free the memory of the container and you have to unregister the callback and that's it. So th this plugin is as simple as this. And at the end with, with this plugin, you will be able to know all the next priority values of all sketch switch events inside your trace file. Uh, there is nothing magical about this plugin. Uh, and I want to show that you can do exactly the same with the very basic example from the beginning of my presentation. Uh, let's see how this can be done in the example. Again, everything here is the same at this point where we open the file. Here we initialize the, cont the data container. Then we have to find the, the stream object which corresponds to the trace.dat file. With this stream object, uh, we can retrieve the, the event idea, the sketch switch event. And now we will register uh, the, the event handler with the callback. So the callback function is the same. I'm not showing it here because I don't have a place on the slide. And below everything, uh, once you load the data, you can do the following. So instead of looping over all the data, you can only loop over the entries inside the data container. So be aware that this data container is not going to be sorted. 
uh, that's because the data doesn't show sorted in the file, but you can sort it. Th this is optional. It depends. It's up to you. If you want the data to be sorted, you can sort the container. And now you can print the same thing, uh, CPU ID, process ID, time from the container, and you can get also the next priority. Uh, and as I said, printing is not very useful, but you can use the very same mechanisms in your plugin. Okay, so far so good. We know how to draw from a plugin. We know how to access data from a plugin. Let's make a plugin that can do both. Uh, this time for this plugin, I will use uh, uh, C++ for the drawing callback, uh, just because uh, the GUI itself is written in C++. So uh, reading, uh, making the callback uh, developing C++ makes the integration easier. In principle, this will be also available in C. If you don't like C++, it will be uh, possible to implement uh, drawing callback like this uh, in C. This is not fully functional yet, uh, but it will be available. So let's try to understand what is going on inside this uh, call, drawing callback function. So first of all, we convert the C arguments of the function into uh, C++ uh, objects. Uh, then because so we want to plot, uh, to see, to visualize how the priority uh, changes when we do context switch on a, on a CPU. So how the CPU switches between different priorities. That's why we want this thing to be plotted only on top of CPU uh, graphs. If uh, this is not a CPU graph, then your callback will just do nothing, will return. Then we are trying to check if we have a data container uh, for this particular data stream. And if we don't, again, we return. Uh, this part here uh, needs a little bit of extra explanation. Uh, if you remember the discussion we have uh, in the case when you open a huge data file and you have uh, thousands of events uh, in each bin, it may happen that you have multiple sketch switch events uh, in a single bin, or you can have a sketch switch in almost every bin in like your histogram, then the different uh, bins will try to plot different things on top of each other, which will uh, result of in a kind of ugly situation. There are uh, actually things you can do to solve this. Uh, you can uh, make your plotting logic a little bit more sophisticated, but again, this is hard to fit on a single slide. So here I would just say, okay, don't do anything if this is not a deep zoom. If you have too many events being visualized at the same time, just uh, ignore. And here is the actual uh, routine which is used to to plot uh, your elements on top of the graph. Uh, you can write your own loop which does this. It's not going to be something uh, very complicated. Actually, it's, it's very simple, uh, but instead too, you can use also some of the routines which are coming together with the library. In this case, we, we, we have very simple need. So we just want to plot one uh, data field from one particular event. So we will use the, the most basic routine uh, that is available, which is event field plot min. So why it's min? Because as I mentioned, you can have multiple sketch switches in the same bin of the model. And in this case, uh, if you want to see only the high prior priority tasks, you need uh, the next priority to be a smaller number. So if you have multiple sketch switches in a single bin, you want to visualize only the one that has higher priority or smaller value of uh, next priority uh, as a number. Okay, so let's see what we do in this routine. We first provide the, the arguments. So here you have from, here, from this uh, arc CPP object, you can retrieve all the coordinates of the graph that is under the plotting that you want to do. Then you provide your data, that's the data container. You provide this check uh, callback function, which in this case is just a simple C++ Lambda function, which does one very simple check. So you know that this will be plotted on top of a CPU graph. And so you want to only 
care about the entries which have the same CPU ID. So you, you don't care about uh, uh, sketch switches on other CPUs. So you only want to visualize the sketch switches of the CPU which is currently uh, plotted under the, the region which the plugin now try to uh, draw something on top. Of course, you can uh, make a more complicated logic here. For example, let's say you really want to see only very high priority tasks. So you can say, okay, I want next priority to be below a certain threshold. For example, you can add this logic into this callback function and this will do the job for you. And there is another callback which you have to raise. So this is the make shape uh, callback. We will see the implementation of this thing uh, just in a minute. And you provide the, the color of the shape that you want to plot and its size. So here is the implementation of the actual drawing. Uh, again, because this is the most uh, simple possible example, you are actually plotting only one uh, data field of one particular tracing event. And you don't care about things like correlating uh, different events uh, between different graphs. So you're, you still do the very basic uh, thing. So in this case, you in the, this function, you will receive only one graph, only one bin number inside this graph, only one uh, data field, and you will receive the color and the size. You can retrieve the coordinates of the, the bin on top of which you want to plot something uh, over the graph. And with these coordinates, you create a text box object. Uh, you have to provide the font. You convert your uh, integer value into string. Uh, you, you give the color. You ignore the size because uh, the, text box, the text box doesn't care about the size. And you just say, okay, these are the coordinates of the text. Please uh, draw the text here. Okay, now we can do demo. So he here you, you see the, the plugin here. Let's first clean everything. Okay, we'll rebuild the plugin. Uh, you just need to provide the, the path to the libk shark includes. Okay, so we have the plugin. Uh, now let's open kernel shark with this plugin. So we will load the plugin directly from the command line. You can do this from the menus of the GUI, uh, but this way it's faster. So we do plugin okay, and we will open one uh, trace file. I hope you can see this on your screens. I hope it's not too small. Come on. Okay, so you, you see nothing because as already explained, you the, the plugin will only work if you do a deep zoom. So let's select something and zoom in. So you can see the, the priority being plotted on top of every sketch switch event. Unfortunately, there is nothing really interesting here. Let's try to find uh, something which has higher priority. And here, here it is. Oops. So here you see uh, tasks with different priorities switching in, switching out. For example, if you click here, you see that the post audio task is switching in and it has priority 109. And you see this thing actually being visualized on your graph. Okay, so just to demonstrate for you that this is, th there's nothing magical happening here. And this is the very same code that you saw in the presentation. So we do, uh, 
So what, what do we have here? So that's the, the get font uh, function, which is used to load the font. Well, what is different here is uh, on the, in the example given in the presentation, I assume that you already that you have only one file being opened. Uh, we can open multiple files, so then you you need to have a, a one data container per each uh, data stream. So instead of having a single data container, we have an array of data containers now. Uh, here is the processing callback. It's uh, it's the same. So you, you just add to, to the data container which corresponds to uh, your stream. Uh, here is here you can see how how is the pro what is the proper way to actually find the the font file not to have it, it hard coded. You initialize the container here. You register the two uh, callback functions. Here you unregister. You free the memory of the container, and that's it. Okay, now let's open the, the callback function. Uh, for, that is used for plotting. Again, it's exactly the same as uh, the one I showed you in the presentation. Here is the, the make shape function. And here is how you register, how you you run the, the plotting routine. Okay, so going back to the presentation, uh, what else can be done with plugins? Uh, one new thing which uh, is possible with plugins with uh, Kernel Shark 2 is that plugins can add clickable shapes. Uh, here you see a visualization of the plugin which was already available in uh, Kernel Shark 1 the visualization of the latency between sketch switch, between sketch waking and sketch switch event. You, you probably know this. So uh, this was visualized with this small green box uh, plotted before the actual start of the task. Now, if you click on the, the, the latency box, this will automatically select for you the sketch waking and sketch switch event. How can you implement something like this? Uh, it's very simple. You just have to uh, make your custom uh, plotting object, which in this call, in this case is called uh, latency box. It inherits the rectangle object. And in your uh, customized plotting object, you just have to implement the interface, uh, uh, which is made of two functions, double click and distance. In the double click, you just implement what you want to do here. It's, it's very simple as you see. You just say, okay, I want to select with marker A, the first entry, which is the sketch waking event, and with marker B, the second entry. And the next thing you have to implement is this distance, functions, distance function. So the GUI uses this thing to decide if uh, your click is close enough to the object or it's uh, too far and it's... Uh, not going to execute the double click. In this particular case, this function returns zero if you click inside uh, the latency box and infinity if you click outside, uh, which means that you really have to click uh, inside the box in order to uh, select something. Uh, the plugins can now register additional menus. For example, you here you can see the menu of a more generic version of the plugin that we just implemented. Uh, this generic function can plot uh, any field of any uh, event. So here you see from the menu, we are actually selecting the, the same thing. We are selecting the sketch switch event. We are selecting the next priority field. I hope you can see this. And we are selecting that we are interested in seeing the minimum values. 
So once you click apply, uh, yeah, this is probably too small for you to see it, but so on top of it, each sketch switch event, you see a small dot or a small, small line being plotted. And for example, you see this line is uh, kind of bigger, which means that you have a high priority task here in every place, in all place where you see just a dot means a low priority task. Uh, okay, how can you implement this? It's again, very simple. You just have to provide another in plugin initializer uh, in the implementation of your plugin. And in the case uh, which I show you, uh, you, you saw in the previous slide, it's as simple as this. Uh, you inside the, this uh, menu plugin initializer, you just create your the widget of your new dialog. Of course, you need to provide implementation of the widget. And then you say, okay, I want to re register this menu. The, the name of the menu will be uh, plot event field, and I want to register this into the tools menu. So you basically say, okay, uh, my the name of my menu is tools slash uh, plot event field. And you, you say to the GUI, the kernel shark GUI, add plugin menu with this uh, name. And that's it. It's as simple as this. Uh, if you don't, in this particular case, it uses a, a QT defined uh, widget, but if you want to have something different, uh, you can implement whatever you want. It, it will just start uh, in a new window, so it doesn't need to be, to really to be a QT object. Plugins can be used also to load data that has arbitrary format. For us, this is very interesting, but uh, unfortunately it goes out of the scope of this talk. But if you are interested in opening your own data with a specific uh, format that you have in Kernel Shark, please contact us and we will show you how we can write a plugin which will make this possible. So we'll be able to open your data together with uh, F-Trace data, for example, or with, uh, I mean, you, you can mix whatever uh, data formats you want and open all this together merged inside the GUI with the help of a plugin. Uh, we started the upstreaming process of the kernel shark to, to kernel.org. Uh, we are right now in the middle of the code review or maybe in the first half of, the, of it, let's say. Uh, this process will take some time because uh, Steven Ross, at, uh, our team lead, is very busy with other tasks. But I guess in a couple of months, uh, the, we will release the kernel shark 2.0 at uh, kernel.org. Uh, at the same time, a beta version is available uh, here on this GitHub repo. But yeah, please keep in mind that because we are reviewing the code right now, uh, this branch here will uh, be rebased probably several times at least. So if you want to use it right now, you can download it from GitHub, uh, but the final version will be, uh, will be available on kernel.org. Uh, we hope this tutorial was useful. If you have ideas for plugins that can help you solve uh, uh, the particular problems that you have, please give it a try. And as I said, we'll be very happy to help you in case you uh, have difficulties implementing your plugin. You can contact me, my email is on the title slide, or you can contact Steven Rosted. it's uh, the same. Thank you very much. If you have questions, please.